Well, good morning. Hallelujah, our Lord is risen. Every year, the Sunday after the Jewish Passover, we celebrate those words. And this year is no different. Although we proclaim these words from our homes instead of from our sanctuary. But if we think about it, this Easter isn't really all that different from the first Easter in that Jesus' disciples received the news of his resurrection from homes behind closed doors. So receiving resurrection news in our homes has good precedent. Before we get going too far, I wanted to share um, some of the photos that you folks faithfully sent in. There wasn't a whole lot of sunrise this morning, but there were definitely some of you who got out there um, to greet the morning anyway. Um, so I put gathered some of those together. I think Chip got out there on his country road. Um, the Gingriches clearly had a big sunrise party with a fire and everything. Um, let's see, who else? Rick and Pat got out to the cemetery for the sunrise. Uh, this morning I went out and I took a picture of the tulips outside our kitchen window because there wasn't much sunrise and those tulips have been giving me joy every morning. And apologies to Bob. I think Bob sent in a sunrise picture from a webcam in Florida. Unfortunately, Bob, I wasn't able to get that. So we don't have that picture, but uh, <laughs> thanks for sending us a reminder that the sun is rising somewhere, even if it's not in Kansas. Have we seen them all? I'm just going through now. Oh, okay. So we faithfully greet the morning and trust that the sun will rise again. A few announcements. Um, the church is officially locked. Uh, we managed to get it all locked Thursday afternoon. Currently, myself and Dale are the only folks who have master keys to get in. So if you have an urgent need to get in, let him or myself know. Um, he is working on getting a few more keys made, and I think ultimately the plan is to get a keypad for that um, south driveway entrance so that anyone in the church who has the code can just get in whenever they want to. So that is on the way. Also, an offering reminder for those of you who feel able and are so led, um, we welcome you to continue sending in offerings. Um, our first quarter did not look great uh, as per Rick's report. Um, so if you're able, please give, you can send um, checks to PO Box 66. Moundridge, and we will collect those and get those deposited. Also, just so you know, uh, Rick and Dale did help us apply for the payment protection plan that the government is offering for nonprofits, including churches, uh, to ensure that payroll expenses continue to get covered over the next two and a half months. Um, so we received word that that application had been submitted or received, I think, and we'll let you know when we hear more. Uh, okay, uh, finally, uh, no fellowship time this evening. Uh, we encourage you to, uh, if you feel the need to Zoom, uh, Zoom with your family or friends uh, in celebration of Easter. Let's gather with the call to worship. I know you won't be able to hear each other, 
Um, but I'm going to lead us in the call to worship that I sent out yesterday night. If you don't have it printed in front of you, all you need to know is the Lord is risen indeed. That's your response. So I'll say a phrase and then you repeat back, the Lord is risen indeed. John, maybe you can help be the response person. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Let the people of First Mennonite Church of Christian declare. The Lord is risen indeed. Let all the earth declare. The Lord is risen indeed. And all Alleluia. together, alleluia. <laughs> Let's pray. Life-giving God and risen Lord, we celebrate your resurrection this Sunday, trusting that your good news can find us behind our closed doors. Brighten our lives with resurrection joy this morning. Fill our hearts with peace and hope at the new life you are breathing into us and into our world. In your holy name we pray, amen. This time I will turn it over for our Easter scripture passages, starting with Dwight, Psalm 126. Reading from the message, it seemed like a dream, too good to be true. When God returned Zion's exiles, we laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the, we were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. And now God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives. So those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. And now our gospel reading from Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended, descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he has said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And now we go to James for Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Since you became alive again, so to speak, when Christ arose from the dead, now set your sights on the rich treasures and joys of heaven where he sits beside God, in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not spend your time worrying about things down here. You shall have as little desire for this world as the dead person does. Your real life is in heaven with Christ and God. And when Christ is, our real life comes back again. You will shine with him and share in all his glories. Next, we have 
some celebratory music that John and I did for fun this weekend. Um, one of these days we'll get some of you folks sharing some music, but for now, this is me and John's celebration of Easter. churches focus on just one resurrection story at a time. Maybe one Easter the church does resurrection, a resurrection story from Matthew or Luke or from John. <laughs> Will you bring them to daddy? <laughs> <laughs> but we almost never let the resurrection stories speak to us as a whole collection. And each telling of Jesus's resurrection conveys something a little different about how Jesus's friends and disciples experienced his resurrection. And each telling can teach us something about how we might experience redemption and resurrection in our own lives. And since we are all celebrating Christ's resurrection in a new way this year, I thought it might be helpful for us to see that experiencing resurrection differently is really nothing new. In fact, honoring different experiences of the holy goes back to the Bible itself. The passage we read from Matthew this morning is the resurrection story I've decided to call the boom version of resurrection. Two women go to Jesus's tomb early in the morning and are greeted with a sudden earthquake. Then an angel descends from heaven like lightning and rolls away the stone from the tomb. The guards at Jesus's tomb shake with fright and faint dead away. It's hard to imagine how this resurrection scene could get louder, flashier, or more dramatic. The two women, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, experience Jesus' resurrection with a flash and a boom. For them, resurrection was a sudden, was sudden and assaulted all of their senses. It was powerful, supernatural, and undeniable. It left them with the explosive emotions of fear and great joy, which they carried with them from the tomb to share what they had seen and heard with Jesus's male disciples. I still remember one of my seminary classmates describing his resurrection with Jesus, resurrection encounter with Jesus with the word boom. There he was, embracing his gangbanger lifestyle when he showed up at a white Dutch reformed church one morning, very skeptical of wasting his time in such a way, but there because a friend had encouraged him to come. It was organ, it was hymns and preaching on a bunch of stuff he didn't really understand. But then the pastor did an altar call and in his words, boom, God got me. And I was crying and praying and hugging this pastor and I gave my life to Jesus that day. 
now. Not all of us have conversion experiences that come with a boom, but perhaps we can point to some holy resurrection moments in our lives that continue to be dramatically influential. I grew up practicing a ritual of flowering a large wooden cross with fresh flowers every Easter. Everyone in the church would bring flowers from their yard or garden and pin them to this big old wooden cross until it was covered with exuberant flowers. In a matter of minutes, a symbol of death became a symbol of life. And the hope and joy that that transformation gave me each year still goes with me today. Then there was a moment in my young adulthood when I was especially down on myself. And mom took my face in her hands and said fiercely, you are a beloved child of God. And my thinking about myself shifted just enough to give me courage and confidence in who God created me to be. There are times when it seems that Jesus has burst into my world with a boom or a sudden blossoming. The Gospel of Mark tells Jesus' resurrection story with less boom, but for those who first experienced it, their emotion was primarily fear rather than joy. I'm going to dub this resurrection story the yikes story. In Mark, three women come to the tomb to find the stone already moved away and an angel waiting for them inside the tomb. The angel tells them Jesus has been raised and that they should go tell the disciples that Jesus plans to meet them in Galilee. Then Mark says, the women fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The women received good news, amazing news, and yet they fled from it. It was as if the news was just too big to understand, too big to process, and so it was scary. They didn't tell anyone about it, even though they had been instructed to, because it just seemed too big and crazy. Perhaps the women even doubted their own senses. The reaction to Jesus's resurrection in Mark was a yikes. We don't know what to do with this. Have you ever received news that was so good you didn't know what to do with it? or news that was so good it kind of scared you? Maybe a child or grandchild so embraced the value of serving their neighbor that they decided to go serve their neighbors in a faraway country. Or maybe news of a pregnancy was kind of scary. After struggling to get pregnant and experiencing a miscarriage, I fiercely guarded the news of my second pregnancy and resisted making any significant plans or dreams for our baby until my second trimester, because I just couldn't bear the possibility that the good news of my pregnancy might come to nothing. Or have you ever fallen in love with someone or accepted a new job that threatened to turn every familiar pattern, habit, or skill of yours upside down. When news is really, really good, it shakes the foundations of our lives. And that can be scary. We don't always know what to do with things that are so good but so big and so full of change and transformation. The distinguishing factor in the resurrection story of Luke is that 
first, there seems to have been a much larger unnumbered group of women who came to Jesus's tomb that first morning. And after seeing the angels sitting on the in the empty tomb and being told to go tell the disciples that Jesus has risen, the women did so and the disciples didn't believe them. They thought the women just made it up or maybe they were hallucinating. Now these women weren't just any women. These were respected leaders and providers within Jesus's ministry. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, to name all the ones who are named, but there are others that are not named. And yet the disciples still didn't believe them. I call this experience of the resurrection the nah experience. Reliable people provide us with good news about Jesus, but because we simply cannot fathom such good news without seeing it for ourselves, we dismiss it. This is essentially the attitude of, if I can't see it or experience it, it didn't happen. A lot of us practice this attitude more often than we might think. If we don't witness miraculous healings and, or other miracles, and sometimes even if we do, we figure, oh, they're just a bunch of fancy stagecraft or mistaken people. Or on the flip side, if our lives are plagued by a series of unfortunate events, and the world just seems to be sinister rather than good, why would we bother to believe in a good God who made the world good? If I don't see a good world, why should I believe in a good God? We are very much a show me culture. If someone tells us that something unbelievably good has happened, our first reaction is most likely to be, nah, you must be mistaken. Finally, the Gospel of John tells a much slower resurrection experience that I'm going to dub sneaky resurrection. Resurrection in this story unfolds slowly and gradually. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb alone. There are no flashy angels or earthquakes. She simply finds the stone rolled away from the tomb and runs to tell the disciples that Jesus's body is gone. Peter and John race to the tomb and find Jesus's burial clothing neatly rolled up and set aside, but the tomb is quiet. Again, no earthquakes, no flashy angels, just quiet and an empty tomb. Then Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb and then she sees angels sitting where Jesus's body had been laid. But she doesn't tremble or fall to her face as the women did in other tellings. Instead, she talks to the angels as one might imagine any distraught person would talk to any other person. Who knows, maybe she didn't even recognize they were angels. She simply says, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And she turns away from them. Angels have appeared to Mary, but she seems to give their presence very little real attention. When she turns away from the angels, she sees Jesus himself, but again, doesn't recognize him. She has a very similar exchange with Jesus to the one she just had, had with the angels. She explains that she is looking for Jesus and is so distraught because she cannot find him and wonders if this kind gardener in front of her might know where he is. The irony of the scene is beautiful. Mary asking Jesus if he knows where Jesus is. 
Finally, when Jesus speaks her name, Mary recognizes him. She reaches out to touch him and then goes to share the good news with the disciples. The Gospel of John has almost no boom. Instead, it describes how resurrection snuck up on Mary and the disciples. I wonder how we are all experiencing resurrection this year. Has something amazing come blazing into our lives with a boom that we have received with joy? Has something new terrified us and sent us running thinking, yikes, I don't know what to do with this. This could be really amazing and really good, but it also seems crazy and scary all at the same time. Have we heard rumors and stories of good things, resurrection things, but remain skeptical? No, we say, that's too crazy. Stuff that good doesn't just happen, or it doesn't last. What's the catch? Or could it be that something good, something redemptive is quietly sneaking up on us? Is it there right in front of our eyes, but we just haven't noticed it yet? Whatever resurrection category your experience falls into this Easter, boom, yikes, nah, or sneaky resurrection, know that your experience has been and continues to be shared by others. Also know that each of these resurrection experiences eventually leads to a gasp of joy, an exhalation of trust, and a deep realization that God's love is more powerful than any force on earth, even death. Christ's spirit is constantly breathing life into the world. Every breath of God releases newness, goodness, and life, life, life. It is unstoppable. In this season of COVID-19, when it seems that every news source is broadcasting death, 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 Resurrection Sunday is our call to remember that God's breath is more powerful than any ventilator and breathes out a form of life that can never be stopped or taken away. It is okay if we don't understand or recognize God's resurrection power every day. Sometimes it surprises us out of nowhere with a boom, and other times it sneaks up on us so quietly we hardly register that something marvelous has occurred. So may we go forth this Easter Sunday knowing that whatever our resurrection experience is like in this year, 2020, as Jesus followers, we are resurrection people and God is breathing into us life, life, life. This time, I would invite you to join me in prayer. From Lamentations 3, we say, Lord, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then, early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. 
This journey through Holy Week is a journey of discovery in a totally unfamiliar world, at least for most of us. Uncertainty, fear, shortages, loneliness. Jesus, light of the world, pierce the darkness of our world with your risen light. For those who are grieving the loss of loved ones while separated by social distancing, quarantine, or lockdown, we pray that your comforting presence would be made known, breaking through the six feet barriers around them. May you, risen Christ, meet those who are grieving in the still center of their hearts and breathe life, life, life. Jesus, light of the world, come in your loving compassion and pierce the darkness of our world with your risen light. We celebrate and give thanks for the kindness of so many rediscovering the joy of sharing and the joy of loving those who are our neighbors. We give thanks for movements such as the rainbow movement in Italy where People are leaving food for those in need. We give you thanks for a gang truce in Cape Town, South Africa, in which the gangs are helping to provide food instead of killing each other and hurting their communities. We rejoice in the inventiveness of so many individuals and companies across the globe trying to solve the critical shortages of medical equipment and personal protective supplies. Jesus, light of our world, heal our selfishness and help us reset our values where every one of us truly looks out for each other as one family under God. Lord, you went through the evil of hatred, injustice, cruelty, and a degrading death to overcome evil once and for all. As we pass through our own isolating Good Friday experience during this pandemic, may we come out to the reality of new life for us all. Help us to travel the road to freedom, to live in your light, and to be open to the promptings of your Holy Spirit, made possible by your descending into hell and rising again on the third day. May we enfold and uphold each other to God's healing light and love today and always. Jesus, light of the world, we joyfully cry out to ourselves and to the world, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And now we will play for you a recording of the Easter anthem sung by the Mennonite Hour Singers. The Lord is risen indeed. Yeah. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. May you go in the joy of Jesus' resurrection, carrying the good news that death is not the end and that God's love is the greatest power in heaven and on earth. Go in peace.